Oh, okay. And um, we are, it's about one minute to the starting time, but we are still waiting for um, Professor Amaratunga. Yes. So let's, like yesterday, maybe we wait for one or two more minutes just in case. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I told I told her that her talk was at nine, so maybe she won't come until later. Ah, later, but... probably. Ah, okay, sure. So I, and I think, yeah, we still have more participants coming so this... yeah yeah we can wait a while oh she, she's she's now here oh hi hi delanti um thanks for thanks for coming sorry good morning how are you <laughs> good morning from japan we still good have morning. time for we still have time would you like to to test your screen sharing or you would like to try during your session uh you mean uh, are you speaking to me yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, right. okay. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm. I'm going to actually. Uh, it says unable to start the video. Uh, the host has stopped it. Yeah. Um. So I think. Um. I can. I yesterday I was able to make um somebody show their video when they were presenting. Um. So maybe if you um, share your screen and then I can see if I can make. Okay, so let me, let me. Uh... Actually, I, can, I can actually make, I think I can make you a co-host and then you will be able to. I, I think yeah. that is what you need to do. Uh, okay, yeah. great. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so yeah. okay. Me, we can see you, right. yes. Okay, so let me, uh, oh no, I think it's the wrong uh, screen. I will get it sorted. <laughs> uh, uh. If you can move uh, the camera a little bit up. To see. Oh, okay. So now it's, it's the wrong, um, you know, my laptop has picked up the camera. I will, I will get it sorted. Can you see my slides? Yeah, yes. perfect. Yeah. All right, okay. So I will, I will get my uh, uh, settings sorted, you know, because I have two cameras and ah, it's okay. the laptop camera rather than my screen camera. I will get it sorted, all right? No okay. problem, no problem. Excellent, no problem. okay, so I will uh, I will uh, uh, log out and log in again so that it will be okay. All right, okay, so I will be uh, joining from eight o'clock. All right, thank you very much. Okay, great, thank, thank you, you very much. Bye. bye. Okay, bye, bye All right, so I think we have our speakers and also the pa panelists. So, okay, I would like to start and I hope we will still have more people coming. All right, so before that, let me, um start uh, my screen sharing. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, this is our the second day of our um, joint seminar workshop between um, UCL, University College London and Tokyo University. And we have some other um, invited speakers for our, our um, this um, events. So I'm Anawat from Tokyo University, uh, Idrides. Uh, so yeah, I will be your moderator for the, the second day. So today we will fo mainly focus on um, tsunami perspective. And okay, so let me um, give some short um, brief introduction of the today um, uh, topics and the speaker. I, I hope you can see my um, screen. Yes, sorry. Yeah, we can see your screen, yeah. Okay. Sure. So yes, so the, the topic of, of this um, event is to, to the developing gen next generation earthquake and tsunami early warning system and enhancement of disaster resilience in urban societies. And this is um, co-funded co by both of our universities, UCL and Tokyo University, with some um, collaboration from JMA, the Turkey Project, RMS, and University of Hedderfields in the UK. And as mentioned already um, yesterday, um, we have yesterday we, we have four talks um, focusing on the um, earthquake perspective, early warning in Japan, and also, yes, um, structural health monitoring in Japan, and also another case study in the US, California, and also uh, and ending up with the social perspective of the earthquake warning system. For today, um, I'm going to make a pointer. 
Yes. So today we have another four, four speakers, which we will talk about um, survey perspective. Um, first will be done by um, Dr. Hayashi, which is uh, from also from JMA, will be uh, a tsunami warning perspective. And also from Irides, Tokyo University, Professor Mass on the real-time tsunami simulation and evacuation. And then for Professor Amaratunka on a perspective of the Indian Ocean tsunami and its early warning system. And at the end will be myself for the tsunami vulnerability perspective. All right, so yeah, so for this, for the purpose of this um, event, we would we hope that um, from our uh, presentation, you can get more ideas on how UK and Japan do some collaboration and we expect to have some more um, joint publication and further um, joint research um, in the future. So by, so I would like to start um, from, the, uh, from now. Uh, our first speaker will be um, Dr. Hayashi from, from Japan Meteorological Agency. So um, Dr. Hayashi is actually my senior. He, we also start our um, uh, PhD research in Tokyo University almost the same period. And he's, he works now in the GMA Research Institute. And he do many research on tsunami source uh, warning and also their cancellation. So I, I would like to give the floor to um, Dr. Hayashi. The floor is yours. If you're ready, please share your screen. Yes. Can hear. Can hear you, and I can. We can see your screen as well. Hi, um, Dr. Hayashi. If you want, um, I, I, I made you a co-host, so you can, um, uh, if you want, you can turn on your video. It's, it's up to you. Yes. Uh, I'll start my presentation. Uh, thank you for uh, introducing chair. Uh, I'm Hayashi from Meteorological Research Institute, the MRI of Japan Meteorological Agency, JMA. Uh, I present tsunami warning services of JMA today. Um, Uh, uh, tsunami warning is operated by the headquarter of JMA in Tokyo. And Meteorological Research Institute is a research institute of JMA uh, in Tsukuba. Uh, I'm in the Department of Seismology and Tsunami Research of MRI. And this talk includes Tsunami warning services under operation by JMA. And I also show newly installed methodologies after lessons from the 2011 Tohoku earthquake tsunami. However, the scope of this talk is limited to the domestic services of tsunami warning caused by near field earthquake. In the first section, I present the outlook of JMA's tsunami warning service. The left panel is a distribution of epicenters of the amazing earthquakes. And the red is the table accompanied tsunami. And these earthquakes occurred near the coastline of Japan and we do not have long time to evacuate after earthquake occurrence. For this limitation, JMA have to issue tsunami warning very quickly as a nationwide tsunami warning. This is a typical timeline after the occurrence of the large of a large earthquake. The first issue of tsunami warning will be about three minutes from the earthquake. 
in parallel, uh, observed seismic intensity and estimated tsunami arrival time and heights are informed. After detecting tsunami in the possible at offshore stations, the tsunami warnings will be updated. For tsunami warning operation, JMA maintains dense real-time seismic monitoring network in Japan. And JMA also monitors real-time sea levels observed by various type of sensors operated by JMA and other institutes. Well, JMA uh, have to issue tsunami warning in a few minutes. It is too short to evaluate tsunami based on real-time tsunami computation. So JMA calculated tsunami height from many scenarios in advance. And the calculation results are stored in tsunami database. Once an earthquake occurred, magnitude and hypercenters are determined. Then using magnitude, epicenter, and focal depths, appropriate scenarios are searched from the database. Then tsunami heights for each uh, forecast region is evaluated and the initial tsunami warning will be issued. So in the following part, uh, I focus recent advances in methodologies, uh, including after the lessons from 2011, Great East Japan earthquake. And this is a summary of the 2011 event. The earthquake occurred off the Tohoku uh, uh, Pacific coast. A strong ground motion were observed in Tohoku and Kanto regions. And the left panel shows the uh, uh, distribution of seismic intensity in JMA scale. Uh, uh, sorry, it's a local scale. Uh, intensity five is almost equivalent to eight in modified Merkai scale. Uh, in the right panel, uh, maximum tsunami height distribution is plotted. Uh, because of many tidal stations were washed away by tsunami, or suffered by power outages due to strong motions or communication failures. Maximum heights are failed to observe around uh, Tohoku and Hokkaido region. However, at least five meter or higher tsunami was observed almost all area around the Pacific coast of Tohoku. Uh, there was uh, several problems on tsunami forecasting on this event. One is the difficulty of quick determination of magnitude of huge earthquake. JMA uh, routinely determine MJMA from amplitudes of strong seismograms. In this case, uh, MJMA was 7.9. It was determined in three minutes from the earthquake and used for the initial tsunami one. However, uh, because of this size, it's Estimated tsunami height was underestimated. 
updating magnitude was scheduled by determining moment magnitude uh, using 10 minutes long broadband waveforms. Uh, however, observed seismograms were off scale almost all over this plan. They generally have to wait for observation of broadband seismogram overseas to determine moment magnitude. The magnitude was finally determined in 54 minutes from the earthquake occurrence. Uh, it was too late to be used for updating tsunami warning. Uh, tsunami warning was updated based on tsunami observation um, of coastal area by GPS buoys and tide gate gauges. The initial tsunami warning uh, forecasted tsunami height as three meters for Iwate, six meters for Miyagi, and so on. However, after detection of tsunami at GPS buoy, a GPS buoy uh, of Kamaishi was installed approximately 15 kilometers from the coastline. Uh, after detection of tsunami by GPS buoy, the estimated tsunami height turned out to be underestimated. It was 28 minutes from the origin time. JMA updated tsunami warning. The next tsunami warning uh, includes the estimation of tsunami height at 6 meters for Iwate and over 10 meters for Miyagi Prefecture. Uh, these are almost double of the initial tsunami warning. Updating of tsunami warning was continued based on observation of tight gauges for, uh, far from the source area. Uh, because of outage of sea level observation near the source. Well, uh, we have done from the 2011 event first the difficulty of quick determination of magnitude caused underestimation of tsunami. And the second, the potential of offshore tsunami observation data for updating the tsunami warning timing. Then after the event, a new observation networks were developed. JMA installed broadband strong seismometer network for robustness on determining moment magnitude. Uh, need and Jamstack uh, constructed a uh, great cable networks of ocean bottom seismometers and the uh, pressure gauge gauges. MRIT uh, added GPS buoys, and JMA also added one ocean bottom observation line here. And these data are uh, monitored, monitored by JMA now. Standard of process to issue the initial tsunami warning has been improved based on new method to diagnose underestimation of magnitude. And check tools are combinations of various types of uh, new magnitudes, such as magnitude determined by extent of seismic intensity. And uh, magnitudes from various period components. In case of magnitude 
determined by a short period seismogram was underestimated. The prefixed worst scenario is used for the initial tsunami warning. Instead of forecast constructed by searching tsunami database. And also the methodologies for updating tsunami one based on observation data, uh, uh, based on later observation data has improved. One of the challenges for evaluating tsunami using data data is real-time processing of ocean bottom pressure gauge data. This contains astronomical tide change, of course, and dynamic pressure change inferred from seismic motion. For example, in the right top panel, pressure change is equivalent to um, several tens meter sea level change is included in raw data. After noise reduction, uh, probably tsunami um, uh, component with 0.2 meter amplitude was filtered out. Uh, in addition, we have to take account of coastal amplification for using ocean bottom data. Uh, classification of tsunami forecast has been redefined since 2013. A major tsunami was uh, promoted from subcategory to main category. In addition, qualitative expression for tsunami, uh, such as huge tsunami or high tsunami are prepared for the initial tsunami warning. The following are about more advanced methodologies. The first one is regard a short for real-time geomet analysis system for rapid deformation monitoring developed by GSI. This system enables to determine finite fault model or sweep distribution model in three, about three minutes from the earthquake using cluster deformation data. JMA used this solution for checking magnitude and estimation determined by short period seismogram. Uh, however, uh, using the model itself for tsunami warning system is a future work. Uh, another example is T-FISH, short for a tsunami forecasting based on inversion for uh, initial sea surface height. And this is developed by uh, Tsushima-san uh, in MRI. And this technique is implemented in JMA's tsunami warning update uh, since 2018. Uh, T-Fish inversely solves the initial sea surface displacement uh, distribution near the epicenter by using offshore tsunami waveforms. Then, uh, synthetic waveforms near coast are generated by linear superposition of recomputed green functions. Uh, lastly, I introduced the research project undergoing in our research uh, department. This project aims to enhance uh, various information related to earthquake or tsunami forecasting 
for tsunami forecasting, we are trying to improve the method to forecast overall process of tsunami, including later phases and decaying process near the coast. Uh, namely, play through to brave tsunami forecasting. Uh, this is a summary of the presentation, and the figures are all repeats. I talk about near field tsunami warning uh, services by JMA, including newly developed methods after lessons learned from the 2011 Tohoku report. Thank you for listening. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Hayashi, for your very um, informative information. And yes, just now we got one um, question from the chat. So I, I, I will read the um, question. So yeah, the question is how early is tsunami warning at the moment? So I think that means um, the first warning message, right? After the earthquake. So would you like to answer? I think it's three, three minutes, right? Uh, maybe you can show the, um, the first figure on the top left, upper left figure. Okay. It's quite small. <laughs> yeah, that one. Uh, well, <laughs> one and three minutes, something like that. Maybe can you explore uh, a little bit about that? If, it, if I can go back to the slide, OK. Yeah, or maybe yeah, if you have yeah, this is better. slide at the beginning, uh, yeah. Mm, uh, this is a uh, occurrence of us. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. Um, the, the first detection of seismic, seismic wave. And uh, it, the time of the initial tsunami was three minutes. Uh, well, well what, what is the question about the animal? <laughs> so, oh, look, the question, it, I think it's just like how, how early. So I think you answer. If okay, uh, five, five minutes after the earthquake for the seismic intensity information and, and three minutes mm. for the first um, warning message, tsunami warning message. Mm. Yes, is that correct? Uh, yeah, well, well, one of the reasons is a uh, 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 tsunami source so, uh, near Japan is very near from the coast, mm. typically. But uh, this condition is. Uh, it's a case of, for Japan. So mm -hmm. mm, this is a, a local condition, I think. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. Ja Japan have to issue very quickly. Mm. But this is not all the case for uh, all over the world. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, it's only for local tsunami, mm. like in Japan. Thank you. And then in the chat, we have another question from my student. He's asking if how, how JMA plan to do it research on the tsunami amplitude um, decay, um, how to apply numerical no modeling on such issue. Whoa. Because uh, uh, I recall a, your, your research 10 years ago it, about the it's, yeah. it's a it's a it's a very good question but it's a wrong <laughs> history <laughs> you can make it short <laughs> uh, yeah for cancellation uh, for, uh, at first uh, uh, jma tried to uh, use uh, uh, um, uh, uh, try to uh, try to refer the uh, First case, uh, for example, uh, if we have uh, uh, observation data from uh, Chilean earthquake, and if a, a large earthquake occurred at near Chile, uh, we expect to uh, decay tsunami. Uh, decay that uh, we expect the decaying pattern of tsunami was similar to the past event. And this is the first step. Mm. Yeah. 
And the second step is uh, based on uh, calculating tsunami decay process by computation. This is by computation method. So the, uh, the, uh, the computation, compute, computing the decay process itself is the final goal. And uh, we do not have technique now. Mm, yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, of course, like in Japan, you have many tsunami in the past, the actual mm. tsunami, and you have record waveforms. Mm. So you know how it decays, right? I mean, for a specific area for this kind of bathymetry, you know how, how long it will be, be decay or, and then you can make the cancellation. But for countries that they have less experience, less um, observation, observe waveform, mm. So they only can, what they can do, they just do only simulation and from their simulate waveform, how much they can trust in the waveform on, or from the simulate, only simulated waveform, how can we make decision how to cancel the warning? That, that can be a new future research. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> mm, uh, it includes uh, future research. So I don't want to do, I don't want to talk about okay. uh, the detail, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Then we have another question from the um, Q&A, so I will read. So with regard to the OBPG, so which is the ocean bottom pressure gauge, so how many, uh, how many such sensors install at Nankai Trough? And to what extent they provide accurate early warning signals due to ground shaking, which could be transmitted to the end stakeholders? So how many, uh, sen you know, roughly how many sensors? I think, oh uh, yeah, like this. Uh, can you count? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> this is all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. and, and the question is like, to what extent they provide accurate word, early warning signal? So. Uh, well, uh, well, I, think, uh, I, I think it's some stakeholders, uh, monitoring this data. So how, how this, for example, of course, in, in Nankai tsunami, uh, well, in, in case of Toku, we have like in, in, Sen, uh, in the north of Iwate, for example, it, it took about half an hour. In Sendai, we have about one hour, for example. But for, for Nankai trough, it is like, it will be like just 10 minutes or five minutes. So maybe the question is like how how extend how early this system can help to make early warning and how any like individual people like us receive get benefit from this kind of um, observation. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, it depends on the mechanism of the mm -hmm. large earthquake and the future large earthquake has a different Mm, mechanism. Uh, uh, the worst case of the uh, source area of Nankai earthquake includes the uh, land area. That means uh, the tsunami starts at the same time of the uh, earthquake occurrence. Mm. It is the worst case. Yes. Anyway, uh, we do not expect a long lead time to be arrived uh, to, to uh, have tsunami okay. after the asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's still difficult for, for Nankai Trough anyway, because the source is very close to the, 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 mm -hmm. the coastal community. There's no more question in the chat and Q&A. I have just one simple question to, to you. Um, uh, for can can this kind of observation be applied to like very rare case like um, uh, in case of like tsunami earthquake, authorized earthquake, or like non non earthquake tsunami, like if landslide happen, how how we can make extremely ap ap apply this system for for the warning? Do you have any thought mm. at the moment? Uh, uh. Uh, some of tsunami earthquake have large magnitude. Uh, if we are, if we uh, 
determined from the long period com components of size. Mm -hmm. mm. But I don't think this is the perfect solution. Okay. So that means you still need more, more time to set up like mm. some criteria, like, okay, if the period or the magnitude is fall into this category, mm. we, we might have yeah. such yeah. Yeah. technical. We, mm. Mm. Some, tsunami, some tsunami aspect can be detected from the, uh, by this process. Mm. However, uh, some should be uh, 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 later from the observation. By aspect by observation. observation. Oh, okay. Okay. I see. Well, if I think probably no, yes, no more um, question in the chat. So I would like to close um your presentation. Thank you once again, Dr. Hashi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank um, you, Dr. Thank you. Hashi. Yes. Um, our next speaker is um associate professor um Eric Mas which is also my colleague and in every desk talk in your city. Um, also, yes, he he's also my, um, yeah, see, it's the same um, same uh, office in every desk talk university. His research um, include tsunami numerical modeling, um, evacuation simulation, agent-based modeling, and also applying um, remote sensing um, satellite image for the um, rapid damage estimation. Okay, now we can see your screen. Um, Professor Eric Mas, if, if you're ready, you, you can start your presentation. Thank you. Okay, um, hello everyone. Uh, again, my name is Eric, oh, so I can, you can see me right now. So I'm the same guy of the picture, of the photo, uh, just different year. Uh, I, as Anawat just said, I'm actually Anawat and uh, Dr. Hayashi are my seniors because we are all from the same uh, tsunami laboratory. Um, and now I'm in a different uh, office, but in the same EDDES. And what I will share with you is uh, real-time tsunami simulation and evacuation guidance uh, for real-time uh, purposes. Um, so, but actually the, uh, well, I was, I just wanted to, to show you also that tsunami monitoring and all the monitoring systems that Japan has. And I, I, I saw that Dr. Hayashi has also sh shared with you this information. And uh, my point here will be that if we are thinking about real-time uh, forecasting or real-time simulation, uh, we definitely need uh, monitoring or, or uh, sensors, uh, a lot of sensors to actually get a, a, uh, reliable information in, in a very fast uh, way. So uh, one of those can, could be these ocean bottom pressures gauges, uh, which are, there are some groups that are exploring those, uh, those alternatives of uh, uh, getting the deformation of the, of the sea surface water just directly from the bottom pressure. But uh, also you can use seismic networks or, or as uh, Dr. Hashi also mentioned, the geodetic uh, network, which is by the crustal deformation, you estimate the, the, um, the area of, of, uh, of the earthquake, right? Uh, which is one of the methods, which is called REGARD, I guess, from GSI. And, and this is probably the one that uh, I will uh, show you uh, today. So, and uh, the uh, real-time simulation uh, method, or or actually the model that has been developed, uh, has been developed by my the leader of my lab, who is also from EDDES, the Hoku, uh, Professor uh, Koshimura, uh, and they also uh, form a new venture company, which is at the Hoku University group of uh, professors uh, working this topic. Uh, with uh, some companies like NEC or uh, Kokusai Kogyo A2 or something like that. And they join efforts to uh, create this kind of system that uh, what they it does is in a very uh, summary of, of what it does is you get the information from the GPS observation data and then uh, you try to estimate the, the fold model, which actually triggers the job in a supercomputer 
uh, which is gives us NAMI simulation and including some kind of damage estimation and, and mapping uh, for uh, giving these products of uh, tsunami uh, height, tsunami inundation, damage estimation, etc. Right. So some of the main features on this this uh, system that is already uh, operating actually in since November 2017 in the cabinet office in Japan, the system management in Japan. It has actually two nodes. One is located in Tohoku University, and the other one is located in uh, the other one is located in Osaka University. Uh, the main idea here is that if the earthquake occurs in the north part and something occurs to the servers in Tohoku, well, Osaka University can make the simulation and give the information. And same if it occurs in the opposite way. Um, the real-time data simulation is based on this rapid regard system that is uh, used the crustal deformation to estimate uh, the source. Uh, and one of the, the main challenges here was to uh, generate tsunami simulation in a high resolution, meaning a 10 meter grid, which high performance computing. Uh, we use the, well, they use the tsunami model, the Tohoku University model, and is run in the cyber uh, center in Tohoku University. And uh, also the forecasting is, is for six hours of tsunami. Uh, it can be less, of course, and it will increase the, the rapidity of the, of the estimation. But uh, the main tests were on the six hour tsunami simulation. And so the idea is from the earthquake to the web mapping products, which really hazard, exposure, damage, uh, this will be available uh, within the first 30 or 20 minutes, depending on the information and, and the location. So this is kind of the first uh, view of what is the, the, the system, right? So, um, so how is this? Uh, this comes from one paper from uh, one of the group members of this RTI cast, this uh, Professor Ota. Um, so how this works uh, is mainly uh, focusing on this GSI regard uh, method or system uh, of the crustal deformation to estimate a singular rectangular fault um, that actually will, uh, I think the, the video, yeah, you can see like this. That actually, while the, um, the crustal, well, the, the, the earth is moving or is, is, is deforming, uh, the sensors will, will give that such information of, of the deformation and then the estimation of the, uh, of the source is, is conducted in real time. Uh, and then it's generally, it will need around seven minutes to stabilize, stabilize and, and have some kind of reliable uh, uh, source uh, of geometry, which will be the initial condition for the sea surface deformation in the, in the tsunami model. So then it will go to, uh, the tsunami modeling using the tsunami code in a, in a supercomputer. Here it says SXSE, which is actually one of the first supercomputers used in the cyber center in Tohoku. But uh, because there are new ones, there are two versions later, uh, SX Aurora and then now the AOVA. Um, this uh, has been uh, improved uh, recently. So the tsunami simulation is performed in, in a total grid of, well, 16 by 10 up to the six uh, grid points uh, in a 0 0.1 seconds interval, uh, meaning what the, the interval step of the simulation for a six hour uh, of tsunami, right? So all of this is executed in four minutes, right? Uh, oh, this is only the tsunami uh, simulation. If you want to have uh, only two hours of, of uh, simulation, we, you can make it that in 80 seconds. So you will have the outputs of, of simulation by that time. Uh, as I told you, uh, some benchmarking of, of the system was uh, comparing the SXAC with a K computer. If probably you have heard about the K computer, which is one of the, well, was one of the, the first ones in the world, um, supercomputers. Um, and then uh, if you see here, even the SXAC can with less cores can achieve uh, less execution time for this kind of problem. I mean, uh, specifically for this kind of problem, right? The tsunami simulation. Uh, and then 
now because there is the aurora uh, you can see the comparison between SXAC and the aurora which for a very less number of cores you can speed up like two times or for a larger number of cores you can speed up less than, you can decrease one minute so probably right now is uh, is is what we have right now is the, the execution time execution time is uh, three minutes uh, for a six hour forecast of tsunami in a 10 meter grid uh, space. So it's a very uh, interesting uh, achievement here. And then now after the Aurora, it comes a new uh, a new other vectoral computer that is already the OVA, which is now probably this can be maybe increased. So um, the main products of this system are the tsunami hype in the short line. Uh, of course, everything in a, in a web uh, system that can be readily available for actually right now used by the cabinet office. And so you can you can observe the, the tsunami hype at the short line, or you can see the inundation uh, arrival time. Uh, this is arrival time in different colors, or uh, the run up high. Uh, including some information of uh, shelters or uh, available in the area. Uh, and then with the use of uh, tsunami fragility curves, uh, a first estimation of possible damages to uh, structures uh, can be done uh, just because we have the inundation depth and then we can just estimate what is the probability of damage of, of the buildings in the area. And of course, we have census information, uh, so we can estimate the population exposure based on the on the tsunami inundation. Uh, so this is also only census data, but of course, uh, we can include here uh, mobility, human mobility information from uh, mobile data. Uh, so this is a very brief introduction of what what is the real time tsunami simulation system that is. Uh, uh, available right now and working right now in, in Japan. Uh, it's not, uh, well, as Dr. Hayashi said, it's, it's not uh, uh, in the GMA system right now. So it's just mainly for, not for the public, but only for the authorities uh, information right now, uh, because it needs still some, some uh, benchmarking and, and some verification for many kinds of different possible uh, scenarios that can, can, be, can occur. So if we move to a uh, tsunami evacuation, um, if you see, for example, this uh, image, you can see uh, vehicles trying to evacuate and, and, and the, the tsunami coming, this is 2011 tsunami. Uh, so the problem here is not necessarily that the previous knowledge of evacuation routes is, is not enough. I, I mean, probably these, these people were, were actually evacuating through the best route they, they thought or, or the, or the uh, the route they they it was probably designated as the as the evacuation route, but uh, mainly because of the timing or mainly because of uh, some other factors, uh, they cannot know exactly how is the condition and how is uh, how risk these uh, routes can can have can be. So it makes it very important to have some kind of real time information to know actually if, if this is a, a good route or not, um, or if we probably we are heading to a highly congested road or, or we're taking a, a road that is uh, is very uh, crowded by, by people and cars or something. Uh, we don't have that kind of, of information in the real time right now. Um, so if, if we could have that kind of information, we probably can have a much more efficient evacuation in, in, in the urban area. So uh, for now, vehicle evacuation is not recommended. I, I, I'm saying for now, because who knows in the future, if we everyone is moving in autonomous cars, probably uh, an evacuation will be much more efficient. Um, and we don't need to, to uh, prohibit the use of vehicles. Um, but yeah, it, it, we need also some uh, vertical evacuation buildings. Uh, we need to assess also the, the need for uh, vertical evacuation buildings. And, and this is part of the whole problem of, of tsunami evacuation. And, and this is part of the problem also of real-time information uh, about uh, evacuation. Um, so one of the, the 
objectives we have also is, is to integrate this uh, real-time tsunami simulation with a real-time tsunami evacuation guidance uh, system. Um, so the idea is here to develop an algorithm that can be uh, they can find the optimal evacuation route uh, given uh, some particular tsunami threat, uh, some damage or some road congestion conditions that are uh, highly dynamic uh, in real time. So of course, one of the problems will be how we can sense all this information. Uh, but you know, in the years, this is coming much more common that we, we can have from the cell phone information, we can have the location from people, from uh, CCTV cameras, we can have the, the the traffic information flow uh, almost in real time. So it's gonna, and now with 5G and, on, and all the uh, Society 5.0 in, in Japan, we will have at some, few, some point of future a very highly integrated, integrated complex system in our uh, urban environment. So to prepare for that, um, we are working in, in in this uh, project, which is uh, led by also um, Professor Koyashi in Tohoku University. Uh, this is just one part of the project because the project is developing next generation supercomputing using uh, assisted by quantum annealing. But this is one of the kind of applications that we are looking for uh, quantum annealers. And this will be, uh, for example, we generate a kind of uh, database of um, optimized scenarios for evacuation uh, using reinforcement learning. And when the disaster comes, uh, we get the information from the real-time tsunami simulation, such as the arrival time of the damage estimation. And with this, we can search in our database of scenarios of, let's say, damage conditions or, or timing for the, for the hazard or, or uh, inundation uh, run up, uh, and then pick up one of the, the, the one that matches the best. And then that will be our first kind of information for uh, guiding the evacuation. And then of course we can do even online also a, a little more of reinforcement learning by looking at the, at the location of people. And then um, once we have this kind of optimal routes or, or, the, or the conditions for the, for the uh, roads, uh, we can share these with a quantum annealer so they can actually, in a very fast way, uh, distribute this kind of information directly to the user and assign a specific route to each user. Uh, so this is kind of the whole framework of, of this part only of the project. Um, so I will, I will just share with you what is this real uh, reinforcement learning uh, evacuation uh, uh, model, right? So the, the main flow that we are thinking is something like that. You have the tsunami simulation output based on the real-time simulation. From this, you can gain the tsunami height uh, at the road network. I mean, you can you can see in each point of the of the of the road network, you can see what is the tsunami height estimation, and that becomes your environment in in a in a multi-agent model. Um, we can partition the area based on what is the 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 areas with, with higher hazard or higher probably uh, exposure of people based on either population census data or mobile data. I would say that mobile data is much better because we have seen that uh, it, there are a lot of difference mainly because of, of the timing of, of, the, of the event. And then with that, you can calculate the population and disaggregate the population into uh, individuals. Will, will, which will be your agents moving in a reinforcement learning model. So the reinforcement learning model, what it does is makes agents try to evacuate and learn the better way of evacuating uh, to all the available uh, shelters they have. Uh, once we get this information, we summarize this information in the highly congested routes, okay? Uh, this is a network with a highly congested routes. This kind of weight or information is given to the quantum annealing and using well, all these, these um, they have these quadratic and constraint binomial optimizations. Um, they can uh, give to each uh, user the best uh, route. Even if two users are in the same, is in the same point, they can give to each of them different route. So, we can assure that there is not going to be any kind of congestion in the area. This is motivated by some kind of previous work made 
by Volkswagen in this in this regard. You, you can look at this in, in these papers. So uh, when I'm talking about reinforcement learning, what I'm talking about reinforcement learning. Uh, so you have this agent, which is in, in your case, you can you can be can be anything uh, that has some kind of behavior in an action that affects the environment, and the environment will give some kind of reward to the agent, and it will change its state. So based on the reward and the change of the state. The agent will have a new action, and then this loop is fit is continued feeding, and then you will have some kind of learning process. Okay, so uh, the main conventional thinking is okay. Let's make evacuees uh, learn how to best evacuate. That will be uh, probably one of the approaches to make every evacuee learn the best route for them. But that will be the best route for just one person. Uh, it's probably not going to be the best for everyone. So our approach is to not using the LP, but use the network. So try to create a smart network that actually will be, imagine that, for example, you are in a corner and you have someone that tells you, okay, you have to go to the right, you have to go to the left, which actually will make for the whole city uh, optimum uh, routing or optimum distribution of, of the congestion. So we have been exploring several methods of reinforcement learning. And um, I don't know how much time I, I have, but I'll just skip a little bit. So um, we are using right now, uh, we'll have stuff right now in temporal difference, which is a SARSA method. Um, but we are going to, to go forward further to much more uh, advanced methods, methods that will give us uh, probably uh, faster uh, uh, convergence to an optimal solution. So the idea here is uh, we can see that even if we use Monte Carlo, you know, the Monte, Monte Carlo simulations need a very large number of samplings to actually get some kind of uh, learning or some kind of information that you can actually later uh, um, use for, for uh, an optimal policy. But uh, SARSA or TD has the advantage that it's, it's uh, continuously learning. So it has much faster um, convergence to an optimal solution. So right now we are using that kind of, uh, of method. And we have confirmed that, for example, if you have, this is the um, evacuation departure of people. I mean, how people will, the timing of the departure of people for evacuation. Um, and this is the arrival of people to the shelters. And we have confirmed that, for example, if we let anyone do whatever they want, kind of on a random evacuation uh, towards the shelter. Um, of course, we don't get a good uh, result, but little by little, we, we feed them and, and make them train. It's like a continuous training. And just after 5,000 simulations, we can get like all the population evacuated before the tsunami arrival time. Okay, so the, the, the training is, effect, is effective right in, in the model right now. Uh, and the main outcome is something like this. You, is like, you can imagine that the road network has the information of at this moment of time and under this state of congestion in the, in the, road, in the network, where is the best place to, to go, right? So if you come here at this point of time, the best for you is to go here. But if things are very dynamic, so after maybe two, three minutes, maybe, congestion is higher here, so it's better for you not to go here, but now it's better to go here. So that network will adjust and adapt that kind of, of uh, policy and give su such kind of information. So we are building a smart road network to guide the evacuees. Of course, we have a lot of assumptions here and things that, that uh, needs to be uh, further researched, but yeah, th this is kind of the first, um, the idea of what we are doing right now. So as a summary, I will tell you that real-time tsunami simulation requires a robust monitoring system, uh, also, of course, high-performance computing. And the current system of the RTI CAST uh, company is, uh, can provide in seven minutes an earthquake source estimation, in 80 seconds, a two-hour forecast in a 10 meter resolution, which is very fast. So you can have mapping and web visualization in between 10 to 20 minutes, uh, depending on, on the area. In the case of uh, evacuation guidance, uh, we can use uh, mobility data and we use high performance computing or quantum learning to actually integrate the whole system into a, uh, an optimal policy and an optimal distribution of, of route decisions. And we are using reinforcement learning for this kind of, 
um, challenge. Yeah, um, so we, we, there are remaining challenges here, like for example, the compliance or not compliance by user. Like we can give you some kind of information, please you go this way, but if the user doesn't want to go that way, that will affect the whole optimization solution, optimum solution. So we, we have to retrain the, 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 I mean, the new condition, right? So that's something that we need the, the system to uh, become adaptive to this kind of uh, behavior. Okay, um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Mass, for your um, presentation. And we have via yeah, mainly two parts: the simulation part and also ah sorry tsunami simulation part and evacuation evacuation part. Yeah. So any questions from the floor? Um, yeah. Maybe... Any anyone? I have a few. Yeah. Sure. Questions. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Eric. That was a uh, that was really really interesting. Um, yeah. It kind of inspired me um, with a lot of ideas for my own research, but I was just wondering, I'm so sorry, I, I have two questions um, and I think I might, maybe I missed the first one, so sorry, but I was wondering how you, do you take into account damage uh, from the earthquake in your smart um, road network? Uh, not at the, at the moment, but okay. yes, we, this is something that we, we have to include. Um, we have also some kind of approximations of, of, of road disruption uh, based on earthquake building collapse or something like that. But okay. those are like empirical equations like, okay. uh, uh, and estimations. But the main idea that we are looking is, is like, because we will have a database and you have a road network, you can make like different scenarios of what if this road, what if this bridge is collapsed, what if this, and, and a lot of what if scenarios. And finally, when you get the, the information somehow, <laughs> this is a problem, somehow you get the information, uh, you can check and, and take the, the best uh, scenario. Okay, yeah. cool. cool. And then um, my second question was, um, is there any um, possibility that the optimal policy would be to stay in place um, given like a, a probability of say the tsunami not actually affecting your location? Mm, probably, but actually I would say that in the, in the model we have the premise that everyone should evacuate. Mm, okay. um, the, the, the main problem will be because one of the inputs we have is, is the uh, evacuation time, uh, starting of the evacuation, which is based on a, on a, on a curve. So it, depending, on, depending on that behavior, we can adjust if, if but we, we will never guide kind of, uh, you should stay, something like that. Because yeah. we start the simulation with, from the tsunami simulation, um, making the, the, what is the area of inundation, and the, and the people that will be guided is inside that inundation area. Okay, yeah. So we, we have the premise that everyone is at risk. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, well, very interesting. I really enjoyed it. Okay. Um, I think we have no question from the chat and also from, oh, sorry. Okay, I think we have question in Q&A. Maybe Eric, if you want, you can also see. Do you have a proxy to measure the eventuality of an agent to wonder because of successive change in a suggestion of the best route oh, for the evacuation? That's a good question. Yeah. So what, what you mean is that, for example, at, it, at this time, it's, it's guided to this point, And then in that point, it's guided again back to this point, And then it goes like this. Yeah, that happened. Some, I mean, in some cases, it has happened. I mean, it, <laughs> observe in the in the in the network right now uh, but that's because we haven't get give to the agents any kind of behavior meaning that they are just stupid people that they just <laughs> follow whatever the, the network tell them so uh, we haven't give them any kind of decision like okay I want to follow I don't want to follow um, I don't want to go back to what I already went like kind of memory they don't have any kind of memory right now so if we include some kind of memory and, and this kind of condition that, I mean, just don't go back to wherever you were before and just skip forward, um, maybe that kind of behavior will be uh, not observed anymore. But yeah, it happens right now in the, in the system. The size Thank of you. the 
similar yeah, to that's another question mm. it's for one single urban area i guess okay let's let's i will read because okay. i think for a participant they cannot read this this question otherwise we, we press the anyway so the question is about the size of the simulated problem and computing time for one single urban area yeah maybe you need more time to simulation or something like that maybe oh like yeah address. uh yeah uh right now is uh we are focusing in kind of one city and and the strategy will be as, as i told you to partition the area based on which areas are higher um highly uh risk and once you partition the area you can create parallel computing okay so that will be the resource you probably will need to uh, assess much larger uh, uh, areas okay more no more question but yeah i think it's obvious most of the time so yeah my question to you maybe you can talk later in the office <laughs> yeah, sure. okay. yeah so oh wait even though we have to move to the next presentation oh okay so just last minute question eric can you see hmm. while i'm reading maybe you can have a time to think so you commented on on probably change challenge of reacting to real-time early warning needs simulation for example drill what what mode could be suited to the dissemination such evacuation part apart from mobile network any um, tools a part of mobile network for the evacuation like in new zealand they employ about blind oh. method yeah yeah so uh, yeah that will be a, a little more of the implementation of of the system i mean once you, you have from the kind of the result of the model, this kind of policy of uh, go to the right, go to the left, according to the time, you can implement how you will give that information. So you can, you can give that information from the mobile phone, which actually might not be suitable because no one evacuates looking at the phone, probably. <laughs> uh, the other way could be that you can, you can have some kind of electronic tsunami sign boards and, and then that mm. will be interconnected and everyone and they will change direction or or if you are talking about evacuation by vehicle it's already in your navigation system by autonomous vehicles so it's 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 yeah that kind of implementation is farther in, in our thinking right now but yeah there are many possibilities of how could, how can you implement the, the, the solution of, of the best uh, route yeah no, okay no, no. yeah it's about the implementation in the future yes okay thank you um you i would like to move to the next speaker thank you very much for sms for your presentation and, and respond to the questions all right um then the third speaker yes she already um shared the screen will be given by professor dilanti amuratunka she's a professor um, in disaster risk in reduction and management department of biological and geographical science at the university of Huddersfield in the uk so yeah her, her title will be um, on indian ocean tsunami early warning mitigation system system of system the, the, the title sounds very interesting i look forward to your presentation the time is yours Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yes, yeah, good no morning, good afternoon, good evening, you know, from wherever you are. So, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Jima, for inviting me to um, uh, share, share, share a presentation. And I was actually delighted to hear the two previous presentations because it actually sets the scene really well. Uh, to, to what I'm going to talk about now, because, uh, you know, it, it's very much on, on identifying uh, the, the, the predicting tsunamis, whereas my presentation is very much on the, uh, the decision making and management of the, of the downstream. So I think it, 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 I think the flow flow is, is, is very good in that sense. So the presentation outline, of course, you know, I'm not going to give a lecture on tsunamis, you know, fortunately, you know, the two previous presentation uh, pre presenters have, have touched based on that, but I have one, one, one slide just to sort of recap the uh, mindsets. Uh, and then I want to get into specifically the Indian Ocean Tsunami Early Warning System and its guiding principle uh, principles and who the uh, principal stakeholders are and how the tsunami 
tsunami early warning dissemination works. I think this is a really important issue because again, the previous two speakers discussed about, uh, uh, about um, navigating through the uh, tsunami uh, identification process. But what is important is transferring that message from, uh, from that decision-making or tsunami detection to communities at risk. So I will be actually covering uh, that, that side of the equation, uh, linking with the flow of tsunami threat and, and warning uh, information uh, from regional settings to uh, communities um, at risk. So this is just the, the, the one slide that I had on, uh, on uh, I have an the one actually, but I'm not going to go into a lot of details about about what what is a tsunami and what what causes a tsunami. Is is of course this is not the right audience to talk about it. But in 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 completing the uh, setting, I have this information, and of course the three areas that we always talk about: generation, propagation, and inundation is is really important in a in a tsunami. But again, you know, the two previous speakers set the scene up really well in in capturing this part of 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 the equation um, and also as we know you know for some reason or the other again the researchers the the previous uh, the, the research teams associated with the two previous speakers actually do this type of research uh, I, I have no doubt in terms of looking into the the causes and and reasons behind increasing number of uh, tsunamis that we face so getting back to the sort of the focus of my talk, which is actually the uh, Indian Ocean. So this is actually different to uh, uh, different to the ocean surrounded by uh, sur uh, uh, ocean surrounding Japan. So this is actually the Indian Ocean uh, uh, um, Indian Ocean um, uh, region that I'm going to con concentrate on. So uh, you can see from this diagram the uh, the Indian Ocean uh, tectonic plates um, and also the the potential for uh, with that, the potential for earthquakes. So you can actually sort of see in, in red dots. So, and then getting back to that, of course, you know, this type of uh, uh, scenery is very familiar to us, getting back to Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004. These pictures are from Sri Lanka, where I originally come from. And the picture to your left is actually the main road, which goes from the capital city to down south. So you can see uh, this was actually about 15 feet high, the, the, uh, the, the, the water level was. And, and that's another picture, the, the middle picture, it was, it was supposed to be a shopping complex. Yeah, uh, and you can see not even a single building uh, can be seen. So these are actually very, very familiar uh, um, sites. And also I think, uh, again, this one actually just uh, still haunts me. Uh, for example, the, the rail disaster, this is actually still, this is the largest single rail disaster in the world's history by death toll, whereas 100, 1,700 people uh, died instantly due to due to the uh, Indian Ocean tsunami. So this is actually still stands um, as you see it is. And then of, of course, you know, there have been so many other other tsunamis. You know, I, I assume that of course there will be discussions on. 2011 uh, Japan tsunami. So I, I did not include a slide, which was good. And this is actually kind of a snapshot from uh, Sulawesi, uh, Indonesia uh, tsunami. So you can actually sort of see what, what happened uh, in, in 2018, you know, with, uh, and of course, I think that in terms of, not in terms of fatalities, but in terms of total losses uh, from uh, September, 2018 uh, tsunami, uh, it is estimated that uh, the, the damage was about 658 million, making it one of the most costliest disasters to have hit Indonesia in the, in the last uh, five, five years. So, so we, we need to be mindful about economic losses in that sense. So getting back to tsunami uh, warning systems. So the Pacific uh, Ocean is, is the most advanced. They have had the system since 1965, but then to, uh, before that, uh, 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 it was only only that particular tsunami early warning system, but 2004 so Indian Ocean tsunami actually uh, identified the need to have more systems. So what happened in 2005 is IOC, it is actually International Oceanographic Commission, was mandated to establish three other tsunami warning systems. What were they? They were for Caribbean, uh, for uh, Northeast Atlantic and Mediterranean, and also Indian Ocean. So with that, the total number of tsunami warning systems actually became uh, four. 
So this is actually a bit of history in terms of early, uh, early uh, coordination efforts. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to sort of uh, uh, go through every little detail, but I just want to emphasize the fact that it was uh, uh, the, uh, the um, IOC, that is uh, India um, International Oceanography, Commission actually uh, identified the need to have uh, other uh, early warning systems uh, uh, during the aftermath of the Indian Ocean um, tsunami. So the getting back to the, the IOC, uh, this is actually the only intergovernmental body uh, of the UN system. So this is actually quite important, specializing in ocean science, services, observations, data exchanges, and capacity uh, development. And this was established in 1960 with 149 uh, member, uh, member states. So of course, you know, it is important to emphasize that its high level objectives actually include early warning systems including for tsunamis so this is this actually provides the top level uh, backing uh, for tsunami early warning uh, systems through the uh, IOC which is intergovernmental oceanographic uh, commission of, of UNESCO so getting back to the uh, the topic the global uh, the tsunami early warning systems how it works is that is why i call it uh, a, a system of systems how it how it works is each tsunami warning system has a particular structure it it is it consists of tsunami service providers and also national tsunami warning centers and also local tsunami uh, local uh, tsunami uh, uh, centers. So there are three levels. The first one is that we call it TSPs, the tsunami service providers, then the national level at the country level and also at the, um, at the local level. So the TSPs or the tsunami service providers actually generate real time products, again, I, I was very pleased to hear the uh, two presenters, uh, uh, two presentations, the previous presentations, where they uh, went into a lot of detail about new developments relating to uh, real time uh, tsunami early warning uh, generation. But uh, here, what I want to emphasize is the importance of having links between tsunami service providers to national tsunami warning centers and, and so on and so forth. So it is really important that uh, uh, this, the, the tsunami early warning system actually recognizes the role of national tsunami warning centers situated at each country level, because they actually sort of, they actually carry the full uh, responsibility in, in, in transferring what they hear from the national uh, tsunami service providers and to issue warnings or not. So it is actually not the tsunami service providers role, but it is the national uh, tsunami warning centers role to do that. So in that sense, this is actually, it is a very, very uh, important point that I want to um, emphasize. So getting back to the uh, Indian Ocean uh, tsunami uh, uh, early warning system. So the, the overall, what I want to show you is actually, it is actually a, a system of systems. Why I say that is it is actually a lot of people need to come together at regional level, national level, and also the local level, linking with so many activities. I mean, and I will get into that in a little bit uh, later. So in terms of Indian Ocean uh, areas of service, so you can see from these two maps, uh, uh, the, the areas of service. So it actually covers from South Africa to Tasmania. So when we say Indian Ocean, we, we think about, we always think about the Indian subcontinent, but it is actually not only that, you know, there are 24 countries are covered by the uh, Indian Ocean uh, um, tsunami warning system. So as, as indicated, uh, why are these uh, uh, maps? So getting back to uh, uh, the, the structure of the Indian Ocean tsunami early warning. So what I want to say here is that in terms of tsunami service providers, there are three formal service providers associated with the Indian Ocean, uh, Indian Ocean uh, tsunami early warning system. And, and they are based in Australia, India and Indonesia. So three countries, they have the tsunami service provision. And, and uh, uh, so I told, uh, I mentioned that there are 24 active member, sa member states, and these 24 member states are supported by these three tsunami service provided in terms of issuing real life information. 
um, so, so this is actually how the system uh, system works. And also the Indian Ocean Tsunami Warning System has working groups, task teams, steering group, and also executive secretary uh, team, which is actually based in Perth, Australia. So it has a very formal structure managed by uh, uh, International Oceanographic uh, Commission of, of UNESCO. So this is how actually the, 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 the structure works. So the tsunami service providers, they support the national tsunami centers based at every country. And there are 24 countries in the Indian Ocean region. So what are the guiding principles of Indian Ocean Tsunami Early Warning System? So it is really important to emphasize that it is based on international and multilateral cooperation with strong governance provided by the IOC. So IOC actually provides that, that very important back, backbone emphasizing the governance of, of, of management of Indian Ocean Tsunami System. And as I said before, it is actually a system of systems because it is a collection of tsunami service providers, national tsunami warning centers based at each country. So that means there are 24 national warning uh, uh, centers. And also national warning centers are linked to national and local disaster management officers. And we call it as L LDMOs. And also this system has very well defined roles and responsibilities and also very strong uh, policy basis because in a, in a situation like tsunami, it is impossible to operate without having a proper policy uh, dialogue. And also what is very important to note is that it is actually fully owned by the countries, protects all countries, free and open data exchange. So this is applicable to all 24 countries in the Indian Ocean uh, region. And I I think I, I emphasized this point before. It is very important to identify and emphasize that the tsunami service providers, or we call it TSPs, only advise. They are not there to provide information to countries on what to do. They send the information, so individual countries need to analyze those information and thereby to take decisions on whether to evacuate or not. Yeah. So because of that, it is it is it says that warnings are the sovereign responsibility of uh, national tsunami uh, warning centers, and also with that, there's a, a performance monitoring mechanism also, with, which I will get into uh, uh, get into a little bit later. So the end-to-end um, -end, uh, tsunami warning system actually has three areas. We call it the first one is the upstream. Second one is the interface, and the third area is the downstream. So I'm very pleased that the first two presentations actually covered very well the upstream. That is actually linking with detection, verification, threat evalu evaluation, and also tsunami forecast. So that is actually generally done by the tsunami service providers. And we heard before the system that was happening in, uh, in uh, Japan, but here I'm referring to the system that we have in place for the Indian Ocean region, which is actually provided by three countries, India, Australia, and Indonesia. And then the next important phase is really important phase is interface. That is where the decisions are taken by the countries, the country's national tsunami warning centers, whether or not a, a, a warning needs to be issued. And if, if once that decision is, is made, uh, the convene the warning and ordering for evacuation is taken by, by them. So that decision making is, is extremely important. So once that decision is done, then the downstream is to do with delivery of public safety messages, risk assessment, and also uh, initiate national countermeasures and also prepare and implement standards Standardized, uh, standardized reaction. So the downstream is very much transferring that message uh, from national level to the local levels or the communities at risk. So this is actually the, the flow of uh, Indian Ocean tsunami early warning system from uh, detection of a tsunami to evacuate of, of people. So this is actually just showing that in a different way, links between regional, national, and to um, and to local. So the and, and also uh, the the uh, uh, the responsibilities between uh, the the tsunami service provider and also the the national level responsibilities. 
So the tsunami early warning system in that sense has three uh, components, or we call it three pillars. What are they? The first one is risk assessment and, 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 uh, and reduction. The second one is detection warning and dissemination. And the third one is awareness response. Thankfully, I do not need to cover a lot about, about the first pillar, which is actually risk assessment, because the, the two colleagues who did the presentations before actually went into a lot of details about it in terms of how they actually uh, uh, the, the predict tsunami <clears throat> situations and then what they do about about uh, strengthening the mechanisms and the new methodologies that are coming through so basically the the, the pillar one is very much on 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 tsunami um, um, uh, tsunami detection and, and warning and, and dissemination. So you can actually sort of see how these three pillars are, are linking together. So again, the, uh, the previous two presenters covered this in quite a bit of detail in terms of actually capturing seismological data and then modeling results and then comparing that with sea level data and analyze the data so you can actually sort of see the, the diagram in the, in the middle and they analyze the information and then they arrive at the extent of the threat information or and decide whether the warning status needs to be issued to countries. So this is actually the operational elements of the tsunami service providers. Again, it was very clear from the previous two presentations um, also because they, they captured this area very well. So the roles and responsibilities of the uh, tsunami service providers in India, Indian Ocean region is three countries, India, Australia, and, and Indonesia. So they actually sort of monitor earthquakes and they generate specific coastal zone threat information. And also they generate timely tsunami exchange bulletins. That is really important. Those are the bulletins that are that are being sent to the individual countries in the region and 24 of them. And also they monitor tsunami propagation and, and, and also they report updated tsunami um, wave uh, observations also. So they carry out a lot of behind the scenes activities, again, as detailed out by the two previous uh, presenters. So then this is actually kind of a, uh, the, the theoretical perspective of, of, of a tsunami service provider bulletins. You know, there are different types of bulletins. It can be just a warning, it can be just an advisory, or it can be just a, 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 an indication about just it is time for us to watch. And maybe it can just be in information statement. So there are four different types of tsunami alerts issued by the tsunami service uh, providers. So that is actually, that takes place at the regional level, the tsunami uh, service uh, providers. And then at the country level, this is what is happening. As, at each country level in the Indian Ocean region, as I said, there are 24 countries and they, they all of them have a national tsunami warning center. So this is actually a 24 seven uh, operation use, uh, using regional and national data streams. So what their main job is to receive TSP alerts, the, the tsunami service provide alerts. So this is a 24 seven operation at each country level. So then, and also not only that, no, no point of receiving, they, they should have the capacity to assess information to determine the local threat. So once that determination is done, it is the national uh, uh, responsibility with, to decide whether or not to issue warnings to, uh, to, to the country uh, and to media and to other agencies. And also it is their responsibility to decide whether to cancel any, any national warnings. For example, last week there was a, uh, there was a kind of an earthquake alert uh, uh, near Indonesia. So initially the, the uh, information was issued, but then the countries decided there's no need to issue a tsunami warning. So in that sense, the, the national warning was, uh, was canceled. And also it is their responsibility to carry out research and public uh, education with the in input from other, other stakeholders. So that is actually at the national level. Then what the what happens at the national level is that they really need to have a very strong link between national and local uh, local uh, agencies. So the local agencies will receive information from the national agencies, and they they have to activate local public alert systems such as towers and 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 there are so many mechanisms uh, uh, that different countries use, uh, and also they need to decide and 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 manage the evacuation process and also 
And also once the evacuation is done or once the clear message is issued, they have to communicate all clear message as well. And also it is their responsibility to maintain signage across uh, uh, impacted communities and also to maintain the public um, education. So again, the, the local level, uh, uh, the, 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 the community organizations are also responsible for public awareness raising, um, institutional capacity development, and also maintaining local regulations on, uh, on uh, disaster management. Yeah. So uh, uh, the, 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 then the role of the public. So that is why I said it is really important. I suppose that that is why it was very good to see the first two presenters where the, the detection and the decision making and, and the links to public uh, is, is very well emphasized here. So the public actually is the end receiver of warnings. So and then but they are the recipients of both official and unofficial warnings. I think this is really, really important. And of course, this is actually an the topic that we can discuss at a different time, the importance of media in this in this setup, because it is really important to minimize any confusion. Because of that, the public must be educated uh, to understand what the official warnings are, what are the natural warnings, and what we are and what what they need to be doing and how to respond. So, in that sense, the local. Uh, disaster management units have a major role to play in, in updating the local population because this has to be a continuous process because people tend to forget about things quite easily. So it is really important to make them aware of official warnings and also unofficial warnings, how to deal with the media and also any natural warnings and, and, and so on and so forth. So it is very important that the people and the communities are prepared uh, so that they know how to react to tsunami early warning and that they have plans ready for evacuation and emergency response. So the pillar three um, uh, is very much on awareness and response. This is actually maintaining the momentum. So education material needs to be prepared. Uh, capacity development programs need to be uh, uh, done. So this is actually sort of uh, uh, highlight, uh, this slide actually uh, uh, highlights some of the events that the Indian Ocean uh, area uh, has carried out over hundred capacity development activities. Um, and also sort of uh, what is uh, another very important point is they carry out Indian Ocean wide exercises. We call it IO wave. Every two years, Indian Ocean wide tsunami early warning testing exercise is carried out so that the systems are checked. So, and in addition to that, United Nations has declared World Tsunami Awareness Day. Uh, the 5th of October, is, 5th of November is the World Tsunami Awareness Day so that people are reminded every year about the uh, extent of the threat posed by, uh, by um, tsunamis. So then the, uh, I mentioned about the IO wave 18, and here I will actually very briefly uh, tell you what is happening in a, in a uh, IO wave 18 exercise. So in the Indian Ocean, six exercises have been ta have taken place so far, uh, starting in 2009 and to 2020. So 2020 uh, uh, exercise was, uh, was held last year in September. And the purpose of this exercise is to evaluate and improve the effectiveness of uh, of uh, um, of these links between the TSPs, the the tsunami service providers, to national point to local level and to the communities. So every two years, the UNESCO actually carry out this exercise formally in making sure uh, that the system actually works properly. So this is actually very much a kind of a testing exercise. So I was actually appointed as the international observer in Sri Lanka in this process. So I managed to actually capture the information from, uh, from regional level to the communities at risk. So it was a very useful exercise. So this exercise actually Actually provided the countries uh, an opportunity to uh, test their operational lines of communications to see whether there are any gaps and also to review uh, their tsunami warning and emergency response uh, uh, standard operating procedures. So these things uh, were able to be tested and also to promote emergency and community preparedness at, at all level. So this testing is really important and this is happening formally
once in every two years in the Indian Ocean region to test everything from tsunami detection to tsunami, uh, the evacuation of, uh, of communities. So linking with 2020 exercise, um, uh, I have actually done a report in capturing the process, uh, the, uh, the, the experiences and, and lessons learned. And this information has now been fed back to the UNESCO and also in turn to tsunami service uh, providers. So this is actually, a, uh, in, in, in simple terms, how the, uh, the, the, the basic information relating to Indian Ocean tsunami early warning uh, system uh, linking, it is actually a system of systems, as you can see. So, uh, and this is how the, the tsunami detection information is actually uh, transferred to communities at risk in the Indian Ocean countries. And there are 24 countries uh, involved. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for really broad um, information and I learned a lot from, from your presentation. I'm actually from Thailand, so yeah, I'm also from Indo Indian Ocean countries. So yeah, that will be, I'm really happy to see this kind of presentation. Um, yeah, because of the time and we only have um, two questions from the chat. So yeah, I, I would like to pick up these two questions um, from the chat. The first question, actually have two sub questions. The first one is, the, do the tsunami service provider issue public bulletins? And how does the system deal with different information from different um, tsunami service um, provider? Okay, so the tsunami, uh, really speaking, you know, again, with the, uh, with the advancement, advancements of media, you know, sometimes the general public also has access to uh, uh, access to uh, uh, the, the bulletins issued by tsunami service providers. So that is why I said it is really important that the 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 the, 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 the formal communication channels are managed properly. But the communities need to be listening to their country perspective, because the the country national point will evaluate information from tsunami service providers, and they will decide whether there's a need for evacuation or not. So the communities need to be following the national guidelines rather than the information coming through the uh, from, from the region and, and from other sources. So I think the, the, the mode of communication channels here is really, really important because there are, again, as you know, you know, so many social media channels. There can be sort of formal, informal, and also sort of uh, um, uh, uh, false information circulating. So it is really important that the communities actually listen to their national uh, guidance. Thank you. And the last question, actually similar to what I would like to ask you as well. Um, yeah, he's asking if, um, okay, so how the current tsunami early warning going on the base of the lessons from 2004 and uh, Indian Ocean and 2011 Japan tsunami, any political change before and after those events? Um, from, from, from myself, yeah, I feel like something like, of course, for Pacific Ocean is too big, right? And we have the PTWC, Pacific Tsunami Warning Center, as a center for give the warning issue. But based on my experience in, in, in Indian Ocean, as you mentioned in your slide, we have uh, Australia, Indonesia, and India as a big country to um, give the, um, pro as a main provider. But we have some country like myself, my mother, my, my home country in Thailand, we have some certain, certain uh, capacity to make warning or do some development or research or warning system for our own country. But some smaller countries like Sri Lanka or for example, the Maldives or some other small country, they have no capacity like that. They have to rely on bigger countries. So mm -hmm. I, I think, yeah, this is kind of, can, if you have any thought on that, yeah, I would like to hear. Yeah, yeah I, th I think that is why I think, of course, you know, not every country has the same capacity. For example, in the Indian Ocean, I think Australia is very developed and India has a lot of, I think, their, their, uh, their center is based in Hyderabad and in uh, Indonesia, it is in Jakarta. So that is why, uh, you know, not every country has the equal capacity. That is why the, in, in the Indian Ocean that they have set up these three uh, service providers. So they actually work very closely and they share information so the rest of the countries can rely on them. But imagine if that responsibility is passed on to individual countries, that is a huge burden for uh, for individual countries, because these systems are so expensive, runs into millions and trillions of, of dollars. So that is why the, 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 this, this regional system is, is set up so that the, the, the rest of the countries can rely on these this tsunami service providers for, 
uh, for that information. So they do not need to analyze information on, on in-country basis in terms of detection of a tsunami. They get that information from tsunami service providers, but they only need to analyze the extent of the threat at the national level. So that is why this, this system is set up like that. I my personal view is that it won't it will not change in the in the near future because uh, purely because of the resources issues because he, you know so that is why these service providers exist. And I here I discussed only about the Indian Ocean system. Of course other uh, other ocean basins the, the other three basins uh, have have similar systems as well, but in India, Indian Ocean uh, region, these three service providers capture that very important detection uh, information. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if no any quick question, I would like to close her presentation and can question session. Okay, thank you very much once again. Um, I would like to move to the next speaker, which is myself. Thank you once again, Professor Amara Tungta. Then, okay, I will um, just turn on my this screen and I will share my um, screen like this. So I hope you can see my uh, slide. And because of the time, I, I can finish by 15, 15 minutes and give uh, another five minutes for the question and, and comments. Uh, once again, um, thank you very much for attending um, this event. And um, I'm Anawas from Tohoku University, Uridis. And um, yeah, my, my talk will be related to the first three um, speakers, which they already mentioned about the warning and um, yeah, how to convey their information. And for me, um, how will be something like how we can make use of information to to uh to make uh for better decision decision making for um for the users uh non-experts and yeah and actually we we just i just for start start to um prepare some of the slide based on our um collaboration with our ucl colleagues so um yeah it's still ongoing result but i wish you can get some some idea what we we pl plan to do in the future um first uh so as an expert, um, I would like to talk a little bit about the mismatch between um, the expert and non-expert, in my opinion. Um, as, the, as a tsunami simula uh, simulators, we can provide something like um, probabilistic tsunami hazard analysis result, like this giving tsunami height against the return period, or like giving hazard map. This is the original way of um, um, tsunami papers what is what what we have been doing just from the simulations okay we will have this this kind of tsunami in within every how many years or something like that but recently when when i have more chance to talk with um local people or um like now we are talking with the industries or now i'm i'm advising our students who are um do some activities near the, the, the course, they, they ask different questions like, okay, professor, if um, what magnitude or where if the earthquake happened, we, we, we should um, give, we, we should do evacuation to avoid such unnecessary. They, they would like to ask through the, the source or the magnitude. But for us, we, 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 we have less chance to think about that. Like, okay, um, and also it's, it's quite difficult to make such um, decision. This is one um, example that I, we, my, we, we did on the local tsunami. So for example, to answer something like that question, um, we have Sendai port here. So we would like to know, okay, if, if magnitude earthquake seven um, happens around this area. So, and if, to, for us to have a tsunami warning level, which is more than one meter, where location, locations of the earthquake should be. So we do many simulations changing the, the directions of the earthquake. And we found that, okay, if these two point in the red, that means whatever location, uh, sorry, the directions of the fault, we will definitely have, definitely have a tsunami more than one meter in Sendai port. And if you are, if the earthquake magnitude seven happens around the blue area, we will have tsunami less than one meter for sure, something like that. So this 
I feel like recently that um so for non-expert they really want um this kind of information for their response rather than just when we give them okay um how high tsunami will happen in how many years or something like that. And, and actually I would like to give you some more information that I, uh, last year um the cabinet office of Japan, the Japan, Japanese government, they they published a, a new estimation of the the Manager 9 earthquake that could happen um, in the, the, the north six section of the, the 2011 tsunami here. And also the, the east coast of Hokkaido, they, they re-adapt, they evaluate this um, earthquake based on their more data of tsunami deposits uh, along the coast. And yeah, and of course they, they also provide like the estimated um, earthquake intensity seven is the maximum scale. So of course, um, in in some area they 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 could have a very um strong ground shaking, and also the uh, they also made a sim uh some tsunami simulation uh and also has a map. For example, the the colors are uh, the so, sorry the the red line uh the the right black line show the the flat area of the 2011 tsunami and the, the color show the simulated tsunami from, from this source on the left. So you can see that because of the manager nine is um, comparable and also the tsunami simulation, uh, tsunami flood inundation is also comparable. So yeah, that this is, this is one thing. And the second thing is that um, because of the, um, the, 2011 tsunami happens here, and this figure shows um, the activities of the earthquake, where blue means we have less, less seismicity, and the red where we have higher seismicity since the 2011, and you can see that um, actually in February, in March, in May, we have three large, uh, more, well, quite large earthquake around this area, which is followed to this um, figure, and also we actually um, estimate, uh, expect to a uh, large earthquake in this zone because authorized earthquake as well. So now even we it just 10, 10 years after the 2011 earthquake and tsunami, but we still have very high potential of the next um, tsunami in, the, in this area and the other part, uh, upper part of the um, Tokyo region. So it comes to our um, research um, purpose um, right now, um, we, we have high potential of new uh, tsunami in the future, and I have no time today to, 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 to introduce, but actually I'm, I've been doing um, interaction uh, between tsunami, tsunami characteristics, flow depth and force against the buildings, many types of buildings until now, but um, from, from now we, I, and from future research, I would like to uh, mainly focus on the industries in, in the port industries. So why? Because um, like this kind of um, accommodation or office, uh, of course we, we can do from the damage data, we can apply the, the flow depths and, and the damage levels to create, uh, we call fertility functions uh, to, to correlate the, the flow depths and the, um, the damage probability, for, uh, a structural damage. But um, if you talk about the industry, it's not the it's not just a matter of the structural damage. Uh, for example, my one of my students, we uh, we already uh, developed, uh, for example, the curve for um, the industry, the flow depths against the damage uh, probability for for different um, damage levels for the industry, but it actually it's not only about the structural damage, but also there are many facilities um, inside the, the factory. And also after the, 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 the disaster, it, the, the factory need time to resume to their um, production. So yeah, this, this kind of information is still lacking. And of course in insurance industry, they, they have to somehow um, estimate this kind of information, information for their risk assessment. But the, I think this is a good timing um, for for us to 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 make declare more um, information about this, so my my talk will be mainly about these these three three things. 
So yeah, I would like to, to introduce um, one of our paper, which is just accepted a few days ago um, in natural health and, and earth system science. Um, our student and, and our international um, colleagues, we, we um, develop a new database of the port industry in these um, locations in um, near uh, in Toku region, for example, yeah, and in the and in our region we have eight um, different in industries um, like construction material, food, chemical industry, petrochemical, etc. So we we generate the um, the damage database, and also um, we create a new um, damage um, levels state for for the. Uh, industry as well, and we determine the um, uh, meaning definition of each damage um, state um, regarding to the industry. So this is how it looks like. Uh, we make a database, and um, it shows difference. Uh, we have like building polygons, and we uh, classify categorize the damage using many um, data source like the satellite imagery, Google Street View, and some um, their aerial imagery. And yeah, and we we have another database of the maximum sunny flow depths, so we we could con combine with our damage ca uh, damage categories, and we apply the um, statistical statistical method to to fit the um, for example, the flow depths and in the damage. So this is uh, just the example of uh, a the the fertility functions of the um, for each different um, types of industry. Uh, again, different types of damage states. So by having this, at least we can um, assess the the damage of each industry based on their um, structural damage. But still, the question is as as I mentioned at the beginning is that the, um, the damage to the facilities and the, uh, the production time. I would like to skip this part, but yeah, I would just say that we also consider the, the pre-damage pre by the earthquake as well. So if you, you'd like, you can have a look at our paper later on. So my last five, 10 minutes, I would like to, to show, introduce you what we are current doing right now. Actually, um, we are quite, um, have, we have high seismic uh, earthquake activity in the moment, as I mentioned. Um, yeah, since 2011, we have another big event in 2016. And also coming this year in February, in March, and in May, we have managed seven plus seven or yeah, roughly seven, three events already. And one event also in, in May, uh, in March also caused the tsunami um, advisory as well. So yeah, for we, we, we think that this is a good time to, to ask, to interview the, um, the owner of the industry uh, about their, their damage or their response uh, or their perspective against um, these three earthquakes and also uh, future earthquake and tsunami as well. So we, we have connection in some industry in Sendai port, which is have uh, in Ishinomaki, Shokama, and Sendai sections. And also there's another um, industrial area in Iwanuma city, which is just the next in the south of Sendai airport. So currently we, we, we only have chance to just interview seven to six industries, uh, but in total we plan to have uh, about um, 20 industry that, that cover um, eight um, different categories of the industries. Um, because of the time, I would like to, I would not go into detail of each um, industry, but yeah, for example, for food, um, mainly um, you can see the production line like this. Of course, um, if the, the water reach the, the height of the, of the product production line, it will cause uh, the damage, uh, totally damage to the, to the industry. And also one interesting uh, industry, for example, like this, they are ice making. So they provide ice for the fishermen to, to store the, the, the fish or something like that. So because of the types of the industry, they, um, as you can see here, there's a pipe here. They, so they have to 
uh, the customer will come with the truck and, and we get the, the ice from the top. So luckily, they, they, our engines facility will be in the second or the third floor. So even the flood come to the first floor, there will be no big damage to this kind of industry, for example. Or this company, they, they, could, they don't have to rely on the, the, to, to buy the new facility. They have a, a capacity to um, build or uh, to fix the, the, the machines facility by themselves. So their recovery period is, is pretty fast. Or um, one petrochemical industry like this, actually, um, for this kind of industry, of course, it can is be easily to cause um, fire. And also, actually, the fire also happened in the industry it, during the 2011 tsunami. So they, they have an uh, automatic uh, system to shut down, to stop all the production line in case of big earthquake. So they are quite strong against tsunami, but very weak um, against uh, even just uh, intensity five um, of, of the earthquake. So last in February also, they uh, after the, the ground shaking, the, the, all the process was shut, stopped, shut down for two months and they could recover um, the system again somewhere in, the, in April. And then just after two weeks, another earthquake, uh, intensity five, and then they, ha they have to shut down the system once again automatically because of the system. So this, so now even we just start interview, we can see how um, industry, Eastern industry uh, differ to, to others. Um, some might be um, has higher and vulnerability to earthquake, but some may be by tsunami. So in summary, from, from our um, um, preliminary interview, we could draw uh, a, uh, the diagram like this. For example, the, the, in terms of damage to the facility, um, the flow depths against the damage ratio of the facilities for different types of uh, industry. And, and also um, in terms of the production, uh, recovery uh, capacity. So um, in case of 2011, um, so how long, for, what, uh, the, for example, the first uh, industry, the food industry, they, they are very small. And of course, even they can, they could resume their production within a month, but um, because of the, because the, they, they were attacked by six meter tsunami so they all the structure is totally destroyed they have to rebuild the new factory so it takes about one year um, for them to to fully recover but another food industry three they have more than 200 uh, staffs and they the flood in the uh, factory is just uh, less than a meter so they could recover fully recover within uh, two months or something like that so we still keep um, we keep going um, uh, interview with the um, industry and hopefully we could complete this and uh, we could com compare with uh, combine with our simulation result and make uh, 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 decision making uh, tools like uh, Dr. Uh, like Gemma has already mentioned yesterday. Um, we, she has in her model um, the number of casualties, number of disruption days and this, the cost of repair uh, is used as a parameter for decision making model. So for us, I, I think we, we can probably use the structural damage, which is already um, um, made by our previous study and combined with our ongoing study on the damage to facilities and the recovery um, production capacity. So yeah, I, I wish um, this kind of um, result will be good for um, our future collaboration and also um, benefit for insurance um, um, perspective as well. Thank you. So, okay, um, I think we have no question from the Q&A, but uh, uh, still no question from the chat. So anybody would like to ask any question to me or um, to, to uh, other speakers, if you would like to? Or Gemma, you have any opinions on, or of course you can talk later, but if you want to share your opinions to other participants. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Anuwat. That was really interesting. And I think, um, 
it's it's really cool to see kind of the 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 way we could apply my model to tsunamis as well. Um, and I, I like your approach. I think your indicators make make sense. Um, and yeah, and I think you know, like my my model was made on hypothetical data uh, from a school that we completely made up. Whereas this is this is realistic realistic data, so yeah, it's exciting. Thanks. There's one comment, but let's, yeah, it's just uh, a comments. Yes, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so yeah, we still actually the, this this collaboration we just well for for Japan for Japanese side we just start um this April so we still have one almost one year to to do so uh, this is I mean just we just start and we just start to um share our um thoughts and hopefully in the future if we have more progress by the form of webinar or something like this we we could have a chance to um report or yeah share our research collaboration result to to all of you again in the future yeah Jemma, I, yeah i have a, i have a question i don't know whether it is actually to uh, to to any any colleagues around so, so yes. any, uh, what is happening in terms of near field tsunami so do you do any specific uh, research particularly in because i know it is happening in the indonesia uh, in indian ocean region uh, because uh, near field tsunamis is is uh, is becoming unfortunately quite uh, frequent uh, around uh, around uh, countries such as indonesia so in in japan um, what sort of research is taking place to capture the near field tsunamis? Because in a near field tsunami, maybe there's there's not enough time to sort of go through this formal mechanism, and and people need to be uh, um, told within you know I think generally near field is less than 20, 15 minutes for for, for, for example. So so uh, how do you actually deal with it in in, in Japan as far as uh, near field is concerned? Yeah, maybe I can answer first and maybe Dr. Hayashi if you want to, to follow up we are very welcome um, for me uh, I would say um, the, the three as you meant, as you have seen his um, Dr. Hayashi presentation we have a criteria of three three minutes so because in, in the past we also have a case that tsunami could arrive within like very soon five three minutes like that so we have local not knowledge but like a culture like um, like in Tokyo region, we have the culture, so let's say ten, tendenko. Like um, if you feel the shake or feel the sense of tsunami, you you just um, evacuate as soon as possible. No matter you don't have to wait. Your families, even you are young children, you have to be trained or treat or understand what what you should do in terms of um, this, um, tsunami or where should be the safe place so I think this this kind of basic information or training or knowledge has been already taught taught to the students in even the young um, level education so yeah I think this this kind of one thing that they they are have been doing in, in Japan against the local tsunami and also they they also have uh, built like uh, evacuation tower for, for many places where they expected that their tsunami could arrive very soon or for, for locations that where they, they might have difficult to build a new uh, build tower for that, they, they could negotiate with the private sector, companies or factories so that they allow um, people to, to evacuate, uh, to do vertical evacuation. Dr. Harashi, do you want, do you have anything to add or is, is that enough? Uh, well. <laughs> Uh, for near field tsunami, uh, uh, we assume that we have a uh, few information about tsunami. So, uh, JMA uh, uh, wants residents to act anyway, evacuate to high places. Uh, we uh, um, in three minutes or four five minutes, uh, JMA is impossible to uh, evaluate the tsunami height for three meter or five meter. So we uh, and JMA cannot uh, say residents to uh, evacuate where. 
if we know the uh, uh, estimated, we know the uh, tsunami height, we can uh, advise residents to evacuate this place. But it is impossible, I think. So uh, that's why uh, Japan uh, give up to uh, give information, uh, give the accurate tsunami height information in a few minutes. And that is a, a, one of the lessons we have learned from the 2011 event for the near field tsunami. And that is my uh, opinion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so in, her, in case of very large tsunami, they, they, we will not say the, announce the, the height of the tsunami. And oh, you, you might know that in Japan, we have lots of um, tsunami signs, like, okay, um, or not only the height of tsunami, but also the elevation. Like you, now you are five meter higher than the sea level like that. So if, if we give the information of the height, for the case that we are not that sure that it will really that height. So people will just compare like, okay, if the GMA says six meter and I'm already 10 meter above the sea level, I should be free. So they will ignore or um, look down the, 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 the risk. So that, that's the that thing that can, the similar thing that like is a, a lesson from the Sunny Island love as well. All right, um, Gemma, we would like to, to close the two days um, seminar before. Um, yeah, no, I just wanted to say um, thanks to, thanks, firstly, thanks to all the speakers for, for taking the time and for giving us amazing presentations. Um, this wouldn't have been possible without you. So I really, really appreciate your, your, your efforts. Um, and then thanks as well to the attendees um, and for everybody's participation. Um, yeah, I thought it was thought it was very successful, um, and it wouldn't have been successful, of course, without the attendees either. So, and I also want to thank Adewat for co-organizing it and for inviting a lot of the speakers. Um, yeah, so thank you, and uh, yeah, leave the I'll leave the final word to Adewat. <laughs> okay, so yeah, this this come to the end of the the two days um, workshop, and um, as I mentioned earlier. So it's just the beginning of our collaboration. And yeah, hopefully if we have further result to, to show to all of you, please allow us to invite our speakers and our, our audience again to, to, yeah, maybe next year or something like that. Well, um, once again, thank you so much. And yeah, please stay safe. And until we, we can have a chance to meet in person again, so. Thank you so much. But thank you. And um, thank you. I just want to say um, just quickly for the panelists, um, if you want to join um, the Zoom meeting, I'll set it up uh, in a few minutes. So, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Stay safe.